Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. And welcome to the session, Canada and the Inter-American System for Human Rights. I was really excited to be invited to this conference on the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights and to share a bit about this regional system that Canada is a part of. Um, my name is um, Andrea Salguero. I'm a human rights lawyer and I'm joining you today from the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people in the Ottawa area of Canada. And around this time last year, I had the opportunity to work at the Inter-American Court for Human Rights as a visiting professional. So my presentation today is, um, the aim is really to give a very brief overview of the Inter-American system and I imagine some of you on this call are maybe practitioners in human rights field, members of civil society. So I'm hoping to gear this presentation to you so that you can feel by the end of this um, 40 minutes or so that we have together that you can feel empowered to maybe engage with the inter-American system in your own work. So, oh, and any questions you have, feel free to hold on to them until the end of the presentation. There should be lots of time for questions. Okay, so let's begin. So this is a bit of a roadmap for the presentation today. So as I mentioned, I'd like to introduce the Inter-American System for Human Rights through uh, giving an overview of the two organs of the system, the Inter-American Commission, for human rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Then uh, there'll be a brief section where you'll learn about Canada's relationship with the Inter-American system and particularly the Commission. Part three will focus on regional mechanisms for the promotion and protection of human rights. This is a part of the presentation that I hope will be really practical for those in, in civil society. And lastly, will be a tie-in piece on why Canada's engagement in this system matters and opportunities for engaging even further. So what is the inter-American human rights system? So when we speak about this system, it is a regional human rights system responsible for monitoring, promoting, and protecting human rights. And regional as opposed to an international system like those uh, that we see at the UN, or a, dom a domestic human rights system, like the one that we have in Canada through uh, national and domestic legislation passed by Parliament. And this system has two principal organs, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is based in Washington, and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which is based in San Jose, Costa Rica. And this system broadly has oversight over the 35 members of the Organization of American States, Canada being one of these member states, and it operates in four official languages, in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. Now, the first organ to look at is the Commission. Uh, this is the one that's based in Washington. And its principal function is to promote the observance and protection of human rights and to serve as a consultative organ of the organization, the OAS, in these matters. And this is from the OAS Charter, Article 106. And so what is the, the structure of the commission? There are seven members that are elected by the General Assembly of the OAS. The commissioners are independent experts in human rights and they don't have to be lawyers. Niche commissioner participates in the general work of the commission, either as a, a designated rapporteur in a specific country, and are also assigned thematic areas as well. So this could be on indigenous rights, uh, the rights of women, many areas uh, on disability, many areas of rapporteurship that the commission also follows. These members can serve for four-year terms and be re-elected at the end of their term. So here's the list of the current commissioners. You'll see the president of the commission is Margaret May McCauley. She's from Jamaica. And these are the other members with the most recently appointed member or elected member rather at the bottom, Jose Luis uh, Caballero Choa from Mexico. So 
So the commission, as we mentioned before, is charged with promoting and protecting human rights in the region. And the way that it does this is through various functions. The first one is the contentious jurisdiction of the commission. And in this aspect, the commission resembles a court. So it has somewhat of an adjudicatory function. So the, the commission can hear individual complaints of allegations of human rights violations against an individual by a state. And the commission can investigate these allegations and uh, publish a decision. The commission can also uh, issue precautionary measures against a state in cases where there's a very grave incident of human rights and there's a, a chance that there's imminent risk against individuals, the commission can issue precautionary measures. And at the end of its findings, often when there is a finding of a violation of a human right, the commission can then refer that case if it finds that the recommendations are not being adequately followed or further litigation is necessary, the commission then refers cases to the Inter-American Court for further litigation. Now, more in connection to the promotion mandate, the, the promotion of human rights mandate of the commission, the commission is also very actively producing reports. These are country-specific reports, thematic reports, and also follow-up reports on different states and the extent to which that they, they've complied with recommendations. Other mechanisms, as I've mentioned before, there are many rapporteurships that are very active, including two special rapporteurships, one on freedom of expression and another one on, um, I believe it's social, economic, and cultural rights. There's advisory requests. So the commission can, uh, Put, submit a request to the Inter-American Court about the interpretation or application of any article in the American Convention, one of its founding instruments. The Commission also holds thematic hearings where it invites members of civil society and government to provide testimony on various issues. This is to help the Commission in its own understanding and also to bring attention to uh, topical issues. And the commission also has an important convening power. It can bring together um, academics, um, prominent lawyers, members of civil society, and will often hold conferences and different spaces where uh, information and current thinking about human rights can be disseminated across the region. So that's the Inter-American Commission. And now, the second organ of the Inter-American system is the Inter-American Court. And this is the one that's based in San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, and the Inter-American Court is an autonomous legal institution. It's charged with interpreting and applying the American Convention. It's the second organ of the Inter-American system for the protection of human rights, and it works alongside the commission. So they have a complementary mandate. Here's a picture of the court, San Jose, Costa Rica. It's a really beautiful building. And in the bit lower level, in the basement, that's where hearings are held when the court is in session. The structure of the court has seven members or seven judges elected by state parties to the American Convention. And the judges are independent jurists. So they're often lawyers. They have to have a legal background and judges serve six-year six terms and can be re-elected re once more. And the same as the commission, the language of the court is English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. There are the current judges of the court. And that's the, the room where the hearings are held. How does the court carry out its work? So. It has a contentious function. So these are the cases that are actively in front of the court that are being litigated. And the court has the mandate and the power to decide on individual complaints that are alleging violations of human rights by states. The court can also issue emergency protective measures and can also, and this is unique to this court, 
can supervise states' compliance with former judgments. So the court has an entire uh, area within its secretariat that is actively following up with all of the states to ensure that they have actually followed through with prior decisions. Um, there's also this advisory function. So any state member of the OAS can ask the court a question as to uh, the application of the American Declaration of Human Rights. And so these, these uh, advise, the court can advise on that particular state's, uh, the compatibility of its internal laws with the existing body of jurisprudence from the court. And it can also uh, comment on the interpretation of the convention and other treaties that are part of the human rights instruments that the court works with. So who can bring a case to the court? So with the commission, any individual organization can bring a complaint directly to the commission. For the court, it's a little different. The only, uh, the only bodies that can submit a complaint are states and cases that are referred by the commission. So in that sense, the court is a second step after cases pass through the commission. key differences between these institutions, as I mentioned, that their work is complementary. One is that the commission, if you are an OAS member, as Canada is, then you fall under the mandate of the commission. So the Canada is part of the commission and the exercise of the commission's function. But the court only has jurisdiction over states that have ratified the American Convention, the treaty that created the court, and further, the states have to accept the competency of the court over their actions. So at the moment, only 20 states, 20 OAS member states, have ratified this convention and accepted the jurisdiction of the court. Canada has not ratified the convention, which means that there can never be a case against Canada that um, is referred to the court. The court doesn't have jurisdiction over Canada's actions. This is a little, a little timeline I put together because um, I, I think what's interesting to highlight here is just how um, things and thought evolve in international law. So we see in this, in this diagram in 1945, the UN is formed and very shortly after, these regional bodies began to form, including the OAS in 1948. And what's actually quite special when we're celebrating the 75th uh, anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that when the OAS formed, the states created an aspirational document of, about human rights called the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. Now, it wasn't a binding document, but the, it was an expression of the state's desire that they would comply with this document. Then fast forward 10 years later, the states wanted uh, an entity or an organ that could actually um, promote these, these aspirational human rights in the American Declaration. And so the commission was founded. Fast forward another 10 years, this commission now becomes a formal organ of the OAS. And still the commission, because its recommendations are not binding, there was a desire among the states, okay, we need a court or we need an, an institution that can actually issue binding, uh, binding rec remedies for violations of human rights. So in 1978, that's when the court was created through the ratification of the American Convention on Human Rights. Now that's the convention that Canada has not yet signed. So Canada remains bound by the first, the first declaration that it signed from 1948. And this is when Canada became a full member of the OAS in 1990. Also a fun fact, 
that you can take this uh, you can take this away with you i thought it was interesting was that the american declaration on the rights and duties of man so the declaration that came out of the formation of the oas actually uh, predates the universal declaration by about 7 months so it's interesting that whatever was happening in the world at that exact time there was this broad conversation about human rights and the need to have um have some kind of universal under and shared understanding of human rights. So these, I'm not going to read these, but these are the main uh, human rights instruments that inform the inter-American system. So the commission and the court, they have the, they're charged with looking at the interpretation and application of the American Convention on Human Rights. And then since, since the commission and the court were created, the other OAS states have come to create other conventions too. So the, the convention to prevent and punish torture, the one on forced disappearance of persons, and all of this together makes up the inter-American system and the norms around human rights. This is a map of, so the inter-American human rights system is one of three in the world. And this map shows the African system for human rights and the European system as well. So you can see here in the inter-American system, the commission is in Washington, the court is in San Jose. In, in Africa, the commission, is in, in, the commission is in the Gambia, over here to the west, and the court is in Tanzania. And the European system doesn't have a commission it, or it doesn't have the same structure of commission court. It, it has a European court of human rights and individuals can apply directly to that court. So there isn't the system of referral and then transfer to the court. So some strengths of the inter-American system. I chose a few things that make the system unique, unique in the world, uh, interesting to think about and definitely relevant for Canada. So the inter-American system is very innovative, especially the court concerning transitional justice. So for many years, the court has issued remedies, not just um, when it considers remedies for victims. It doesn't stop at just monetary compensation for victims and can also issue remedies that look to restore to restorative justice and to try and make the victims whole to the extent that they can. So some remedies um, can be, for example, asking the state to create a school in the name of the victim. If the victim really loved music, it could be a music school. Uh, or the state will be asked to make a public apology to publish that apology for a certain amount of time or to create a monument, a public monument for people to remember a particular, particularly uh, atrocious violation of human rights and other uh, remedies of this nature, um, which is quite innovative. E even, even looking at the other regional systems in Europe and in Africa. Um, this, this system has also developed a strong body of jurisprudence and uh, leadership around certain issues like enforced disappearance and violence against women to the extent that even international systems like the United Nations may look to, to the system for the latest, uh, the latest thought. Uh, this system doesn't have a margin of appreciation legal doctrine. And this may be a bit technical, but it's, uh, it's something unique. So in the European court, in the European system, there's this doctrine called margin of appreciation, where essentially the European Court of Human Rights will recognize that in some instances, it can or it should show deference to the different ways that human rights norms are applied in national uh, law. And this gives states some flexibility 
in how uh, the regional norm is reflected in their law. And it also shows a bit of a bit of um, where the court takes a step back in um, in deference to the decisions that are made, legislative legislative decisions that are made by different countries. And what this does is um, sometimes it leads to less consistent case law coming out of the European court because there is this uh, ability for states to have a bit of wiggle room to derogate from uh, the regional norms. And in the inter-American system, this legal doctrine is not practiced. And actually, there's a principle of complementarity, which means that if a state has internal laws that are out of step with the regional understanding of human rights, that state is expected to change their laws to match the regional system. So over time, that's produced a very consistent body of jurisprudence and has, has led to a clear shared understanding around the application of different human rights laws uh, or different articles in the American Convention. Something else that's a bit special is that the commission, uh, in the inter-American system, we have hearings which is where a victim will have the opportunity to go and stand before the court and give their testimony or uh, or even through the commission in some way can also have uh, hearings to clarify different aspects of their case. And this is not a given in the regional systems around the world because uh, while offering hearings to victims is a uh, an investment of resources, it's an investment of time, and other tribunals may choose to just uh, ask victims to send all of their complaints through by written statements. But in this system, it is important that the victim has a day in court, has a day to actually give their testimony. And this is a, a unique feature for, for victims uh, in, in the Americas. I, I mentioned this briefly before, uh, but in the the Inter-American Court is the only the only regional court, to my knowledge, that has a supervisory function for compliance. So there's as much energy put into um, the investigation of cases as there is to follow up after the decision is made, and that has really boosted compliance with recommendations, although it it still is a challenge that some states will just, um, even though they receive a sentence from the court, they'll opt not to follow it. So the second part is more focusing on Canada and the inter-American system. So I mentioned before, that Canada became a full member of the OAS in 1999, so a good 30, 33 years now, and, and so is a part of the inter-American system. And Canada is, is um, in this system, remains bound by the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man from 1948, but it has not accepted the jurisdiction of the court, which means that for the functions of the court, Canada can only participate in the advisory function of the court. So if someone submits a question to the court, Canada can participate along with other states and send in submissions to the court, but it's not part of the complaints process. Still, Canada is a full member and fully under the mandate of the commission. And this means that uh, Canada can participate in the individual petitions complaint process, or Canadians rather can participate in individual petitions, in thematic hearings, precautionary measures, advisory requests, the rapporteurships, country visits, and can also um, Canada can also provide political support for adopting resolutions on essential human rights issues. So in the time Canada has been part of the OAS, the, there haven't been a great 
number of petitions placed made against Canada, although there have been some. And in recent years, the commission has published one admissibility report on the Hukuminum Treaty Group case, the Loni Edmonds case, and two merits reports on asylum matters. So one is for the Suresh case and for John Doe. The commission has also done country visits to Canada. So in 1997, uh, the commissioner, a commissioner visited Canada uh, to explore issues around uh, de the detention of asylum seekers. And this report was, uh, this visit was uh, mentioned in a thematic report on the situation of human rights and asylum seekers within the Canadian refugee determination system. There was also a country visit specific to the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada. This was in 2012. That visit also res resulted in a publication. It resulted in follow-up thematic hearings uh, on the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. So this was after Canada announced that there would be a national inquiry. The commission held biannual thematic hearings to understand what the terms of the mandate of this commission of this inquiry would be, and to also follow up on recommendations that it had. Uh, given to Canada. It also published a press release on this matter in 2019. In 2019, the Commission published a press release regarding reports of forced sterilization against Indigenous women in Saskatchewan, and follow-up on that issue is ongoing. And in the same way, uh, there's a report that um, mentioned the role of Canadian industries operating abroad, often mining companies and the human rights impact that they have in different countries. And so there was one report that examined possible um, international responsibility for violations that are committed by non-state third party actors. So that violations that are done by not the government itself, but uh, but third-party actors operating in another country and to explore whether or not Canada could be found responsible for their actions. The reporting function is not always negative and there are also instances where uh, the Commission has issued press releases congratulating Canada for uh, good practices. And I've listed them there. One is for creating an ombudsman role for Canadian companies acting abroad, and the other one was for creating a multi-stakeholder advisory board. Okay. So in this, this part of the presentation, this is the, the part that I'm hoping is really practical to, to those who might be in civil society and who may be wondering, well, how does it work? to submit a petition to the commission or how does it work to engage practically with the inter-American system? So these are some regional mechanisms that are available to individuals and civil society organizations in Canada. The first is the petition and the case system in the, at the commission. So any person who believes that they've been a victim of human rights violations can file a petition before the Inter-American Commission and initiate a process in which the facts will be verified. And if the state is found responsible, the commission will make recommendations to prevent that human right violation from happening again, to investigate the facts and to make reparations. Now, you'll notice here that only states can be found responsible for violations of human rights before the commission. So if it's an indiv another individual that violated another individual's rights, that's not something that would go to the commission unless you're trying to demonstrate that the, that the state was somehow um, responsible either through 
acquiescing because it knew of the violation and didn't do anything or um, or um, through negligence or a failure to investigate uh, adequately. So here are some criteria. If you're thinking of bringing a petition to the Inter-American Court, it has to, the petition has to uh, be looking at a violation of a right established in the American Convention and Declaration, because those are the only instruments that the court and the commission, or sorry, the commission, we're talking about the commission here. They're the only instruments that the commission has the competency to apply. Uh, before a petition can go, can be submitted to the commission, all domestic remedy, uh, judicial remedies must be exhausted. That means that you, the individual should try and seek recourse within their country to the highest level. And once that all, the, all opportunities are exhausted, then they can go to the commission. The only exception are cases where um, sometimes the state interferes with an individual's ability to to seek these judicial remedies. So if the state is not giving the individual due process or if they're blocked in some way, or if the state is contributing to uh, an unresolved delay, in those cases, the commission might make an, an exception and still accept the petition. Generally, the petition has to be submitted within six months of the final judicial decision so if you can imagine in the Canadian context, you would have to submit to the commission six months after receiving a decision from the Supreme Court of Canada. It can be a favor, uh, and often it's not a favorable decision. So at the uh, six months after the date of notification. And the same claim cannot be before another international body. It's if it's before another international body, it has to be resolved there. And um, I mentioned this before, the commission can only focus on the responsibility of a state, not individuals. So you're looking at cases where either the state directly violated someone's rights, or maybe they tacitly allowed for the violation of rights or just completely failed to adequately um, sanction uh, or investigate the violation of rights. So this chart shows the, the flow um, through the commission's process. So in the top corner, you have when a petition is received and it goes into the first stage, which is referred to under, under study. So because the commission receives so many petitions, it's like the first, the first look over to see that the petition complies with the requirements of Article 28 from the commission's rules of procedure. If at that point, the petition is considered uh, acceptable, then it passes into the admissibility stage. And this is where typically the states will be notified of the individual's complaint, will be given an opportunity to respond, and will be given, um, and where the commission can ask the individual petitioner for more information. At the end of this stage, the, the commission will produce a report an admissibility report. So we'll either say, yes, this petition is admissible and it'll go on to the next stage or no, it's not an admissible and the process stops there. If it is admissible, it goes to the merit stage. And this is where the commission is really looking at the substantive arguments uh, in, the, in the case and will typically hold a hearing and we'll really try and get to the bottom of whether there was a violation of human rights. Again, these findings will be produced in what's called a merits report, which may have recommendations for a state depending on whether a violation of human rights was found or not. After this, the petition will go into the follow-up stage where the commission will periodically 
check in on whether recommendations are being followed and uh, or if the conditions of a friendly settlement are being followed. So at any point, once a case is considered admissible, the parties can have a friendly settlement. So the individual and the state can come to an agreement outside of the commission's um, decision making, uh, but they do have to honor the conditions of that agreement and the commission will follow up with it. At the bottom here, I have um, a box for archive. Archive can also happen at any point. Uh, it's when the initial issue is somehow resolved, so it doesn't exist anymore. You could imagine if there was an, issue, an initial complaint about um, not having access uh, to judicial um, to, your, to your judicial rights to be able to bring something to court, if that's somehow resolved, or if somehow the state offers the victim compensation or, or something happens, then the whole petition can be archived. It also happens that because cases are brought to the commission many, many years after the original incident, sometimes individuals for due to time or resources will let their petition lapse, will stop with the process and then the case will get archived. And this doesn't apply for Canada, but if Canada had ratified the, the jurisdiction of the court, had accepted the jurisdiction of the court, after the follow-up phase, there would be an additional option for the commission to refer a case for litigation to the court. But because Canada hasn't, um, accepted the jurisdiction, then the process stops here at the follow-up. Um, we covered this, so I don't think I'll go into the details of, of how a petition moves through the court. But another mechanism that I think is, is interesting to highlight for, for you, for Canadian civil society, um, and experts in, in human rights are the thematic hearings. So thematic hearings are an opportunity to raise awareness. This, this is also at the commission. So thematic hearings at the commission. Uh, these hearings are, are an opportunity to raise awareness of human rights issues, to build coalitions, to strengthen regional and international human rights framework, advocate for changes to law and policy and promote regional norms. So these hearings, there's two types. One is case-based, so where the commission will call a hearing to gather more facts or information about an ongoing, uh, a specific petition. And then there are thematic hearings of a more general nature. So the, the commission may call a thematic hearing to receive recent information about a specific human rights issue or to have an update from one or more OAS member states. These thematic hearings can be held at the commission's initiative or by request from civil society and governments. So if civil society feels that there's a very pressing human rights issue that needs to be brought to the attention of the commission, they can request a hearing on a specific matter. The commission has the power to accept or reject the hearing based on its own assessment of, of the needs and maybe its own resources and capacities. But in general, about a third of hearing requests are granted and there's about 55 hearings held per session. So there's two sessions held <clears throat> per year, usually in one in March and one in October. So there's about 55 thematic hearings or 55 opportunities to bring different issues to the commission. The hearings are usually public, but can also be held in private. And they're usually one hour. So the commissioners will be seated and civil society uh, in however they want to use their 20 minutes, will have 20 minutes to present on their issue. Then the government, if there's a government delegation, they'll get 20 minutes to also respond to the same issue and then 20 minutes to answer questions from commissioners. The commissioners, as I mentioned before, are really trying to understand the issue. If there are many countries that are bringing um, 
that are participating in the thematic hearing, then there's only 45 minutes allotted to the hearing and there's no government delegations present because they'll be hearing from multiple delegations. So what, um, what human rights advocates do is they use these thematic hearings as an opportunity as part of their broader advocacy strategy. And this is independent of whether they're connected to a petition in front of the commission or not. Um, and that's because the thematic hearings are a regular periodic opportunity to shed light on human rights concerns. And they're not limited by the same rules of procedure that we saw for the individual petitions. So there's no limitation of six months. You don't have to exhaust all domestic human remedies, uh, all domestic judicial uh, remedies rather. So at, at any point, anyone, any civil society organization or individual at any point can approach the commission with, a, with an issue. The public nature of the hearings um, brings attention to issues and it raises a profile of a certain understanding of human rights. The hearings also can focus the commission on a particular course of action, which again, furthers understanding and action around a particular issue. And going in front of the commission and putting together the, the 20 minutes on behalf of civil society also creates um, opportunities for working together with other groups and opportunity to build coalitions. The last one is similar. It brings together stakeholders to clarify regional norms and government obligations. So you can also imagine that um, in, in being at a thematic hearing and in having the government also be there to present their 20 minutes, it's an opportunity to hear the government's position on different issues or the government's explanation on their response to different issues. And that's, that's quite powerful, especially for some states that may not have any transparency from their government on a given issue. There's at least a, a measure of having to, to, to talk about these issues and, and bring them, um, work together on them. The third mechanism I mentioned before, that's also available to Canadian individuals and Canadian uh, civil society are the rapporteurships. And the thematic rapporteurships of the commission devote attention to certain groups, communities and peoples that are particularly at risk of human rights violations due to their state vulnerability and discrimination they have faced historically. And the purpose of a thematic rapporteurship is to strengthen, promote, and systematize the Inter-American Commission's own work on the issue. So rapporteurships have evolved as the commission has undertaken its work. And generally, again, to for the commission to understand an issue better and to follow it uh, in a more systematic way. So these are the current rapporteurships that are at the Human Rights Commission. You'll see that the first one is as early as 1990, and there's been ongoing uh, a, a ongoing addition to the list with the last one being added in 2019 for the rights of persons with disabilities. I highlighted in yellow two special rapporteurships. So generally among the, the commissioners, they will divide the rapporteurships. So they'll have areas of focus among them that they follow the same way that they split up the different countries of the OAS, um, again, so to allow them to focus on particular countries or issues. At some point, however, it was decided that there, were, there needed to be specific attention to freedom of expression in 1997 and to economic, social, cultural, envir and environmental rights. So the commission created a special rapporteurship position so this special rapporteur is not a commission, is not a commissioner, um, but is hired 
as an independent expert to specifically follow freedom of expression and economic, social, cultural, environmental rights. So the special rapporteur will produce their own reports, will also visit dis different countries and assist the commission in its work. So a civil society, there's an access point again to the work of the commission and to promoting human rights through these different areas of, of thematic focus. So this last part of the presentation is why, so we see that Canada is engaged to a certain degree in the work of the commission, but more broadly, why does this engagement matter? Why does uh, further engagement matter? So these, these points here are borrowed from uh, a keynote speech from the president of the commission. Her name is Margaret McCauley, and she visited the University of Quebec and Montreal uh, last year, actually in 2022. And so she very strongly expressed that it's the commission's hope and really uh, that, that Canada will ratify the American <clears throat> convention and accept the jurisdiction of the court. And there, um, the president mentioned that if Canada were to do so and fully participate in the inter-American system, it would increase Canada's legitimacy and credibility when it calls on other states to respect human rights. For example, um, Canada has, has been vocal about uh, the rights of women and girls and about promoting these rights. And the inter-American system has a convention called the Belen do Para Convention, which is the, uh, it's been described as the most important human rights instrument in the world for the protection of human, uh, for, of women's rights, because it gets into domestic violence issues and, and really um, has very strong language against violence against women. So if Canada were to it would be it would be an opportunity for Canada to strengthen its its resolve around these issues even more on a regional level. Um, ratifying and the convention would also strengthen Canada's political influence and leadership in the Americas. So the president of the commissioner of the commission mentioned that there is um, a current of of populism that affects support for the commission and the court and its work. And it would mean a lot for Canada to support the, the court, not just financially, but with the full uh, acceptance of this regional human rights conversation. Canada would also benefit from this, the innovation that's happening at the level of, of human rights the jurisprudence of the court and the the innovative features of I mentioned before this Belém do Pará Convention and other other treaties that are being developed through the OAS and uh, and also Canada when it if it were to participate in the court there would certainly be cases uh, against Canada before the court and that would enrich the the jurisprudence of the court and the inter-American system as a whole to have a diversity of cases. Another, another factor I wanna highlight is that participation in the inter-American system is a reflection of our shared reality of the Americas. So it's maybe, maybe in 1990, it would have seemed like, okay, maybe the inter-American system has more of a Latin American focus. Maybe the issues in Canada are, maybe we, we understand them in different ways. But increasingly, I think it's become undeniable that human rights discourses in Canada are inextricably connected to the regional discourses. And we see this particularly on issues around migration, around climate change, around labor practices. And as I mentioned before too, on, on the, the work of businesses, Canadian businesses in other countries, we, are, we have a shared reality on the Americas and we should have a shared human rights 
reality as well. Now, I, I don't want you to leave this presentation thinking that this is all in Canada's hands or that what, what we need is that only government action matters here because I want to emphasize that civil society really matters as well uh, in participating in the commission as, as civil society has already done. Um, and so I wanted to highlight the petition of Mariano Abarca this is a very recent petition against Canada that was submitted to the commission. And uh, in 2009, Mariano was unfortunately um, murdered in front of his restaurant in Mexico, in the area of Chiapas, uh, because he was a community leader that was speaking out about the actions of a Canadian mine in his community. And so um, as, this, as this situation became more tense, he and his life was put at risk, he was, he was murdered. And the reason that this implicates Canada is because what Mariano's family is alleging as the victims in this case is that the Canadian embassy knew that his life was at risk and at worst case, the Canadian embassy contributed to an increasingly unsafe situation for him and failed to protect him. So this is a case where Canada's responsibility for uh, through the actions of its embassy is being questioned. And um, it was submitted by a, a group of lawyers, Justice and Corporate Accountability Project Canada. Um, and oh yeah, so I want to highlight for this case that I'm including it here because I think it's a perfect example of how civil society can interact with the commission and also the extent to which we're all connected across the Americas. So in this case, the human rights violation happened in Mexico. Uh, it's alleged that it implicates the Canadian government. And we see that it was submitted by Justice and Corporate Accountability Project Canada. So a group of lawyers that were supporting the initiative but also the initiative was supported by civil society organizations in Canada and Mexico. So Mining Watch in Canada, Otros Mundos in Chiapas. And when Mariano Barca's son, Luis came to Canada to raise awareness about the case and the issue, um, again, we saw a whole network of, organi of Canadian organizations support his visit and really do um, really support him uh, raising awareness about the issue. So this is a photo of Lu Jose Luis Abarca, that's Mariano's son speaking in Canada. And uh, his visit was facilitated by civil society and they were successful in organizing a press conference in Ottawa, getting co coverage in the Canadian media it strengthened cooperation among networks in Mexico and Canada. Um, they were able to engage with government on, on the human rights issue with MPs and with senators. And it also raises awareness about the human rights issue across the, country, uh, across the continent. So when an issue like this comes to the commission, it's not, it doesn't just have a relevance for Canada but other countries are also watching as well to see what, what will be the outcome and how um, human rights norms will be built around this case. So it's very early stages for this petition, um, but what I wanted to highlight is that in a way the outcome, the outcome matters, but also the process and the whole conversation around a petition is is equally valuable. Um, yes. So I've included some sources at the end um, if anyone is interested to learn more. But at this point, I'm really happy to receive questions about the presentation and um, or any comments from from you in the in the audience. Thank Andrea, you. I have some questions for you. 
Sure. So you said that Canada is not a full member and Canada can participate as an advisor. So can you please clarify on the differences between the advisory and the, and the, and the court? Yes. Yes. So uh, the commission uh, can ask states or, so, or the commission can ask the court uh, questions about how the convention will be applied um, or interpreted. And member states can also ask the court questions. And so this function of asking the court questions is available to Canada. And usually, usually. when a state does ask the, a question, other states will respond with their own submissions to the court to say, you know, as the court is thinking about this issue, consider this or consider Colombia's position on this, consider Canada's views on this. And so th there is a way for all of the states to participate. Um, but that's just in the advisory. So that's just when the court is going to give an advisory opinion, which I see. which is not the same as when there's an individual complaint moving through the court. So earlier in your presentation, you asked, you talked to us about a uh, margin of appreciation and the differences mm -hmm. between um, the jurisdictions. Um, so I'm wondering, um, are there, uh, what are the examples of states that have internal state laws that differ, that differ from the regional state laws, regional laws, I mean? Sure. Um, so um, the American Convention um, protects freedom of expression. And the way that the court has, one of the ways that the court has interpreted this right is that states cannot um, have a criminal, um, how would I say this? A, a, a criminal consequence for uh, defamation. Because, okay. because when someone, because if the state accuses someone of defamation, then they might end up with a criminal record or serving jail time and this would have a negative effect on liberty of expression in that country. So there was a case before the court where um, one of the states says, well, in our laws, defamation does is a criminal, is a crime, and does come with a criminal record and possible jail time. Uh, but in the inter-American system, that's not an excuse. So that state would have to change its laws to match the regional norm, which is that defamation cannot have a criminal consequence. I see. <clears throat> so like in that case, the United States laws differs from the regional recommendations or the regional. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'd, I actually don't know about um, the US specifically. But there are, again, the U.S. also has not accepted the jurisdiction of the court. So Canada and the U.S. are a bit outside of the framework that the other countries are operating under. I see. You said the process involves understudy and admi uh, admissibility um, and uh, merits. So you, the four stages that you mentioned earlier. Yes. I yes. just want to clarify the differences between sure, the understudy yes. and admissibility portion, like steps one and two. Um. So, step here. I can, I can pull up some notes here. Yeah. What is the difference between understudy and admissibility? So one way to think of it is that understudy is the initial assessment stage where the commission is just looking at, is this petition, you could say, is it filled out correctly? You know, is it looking at, um, it's, is it really they're looking at, is it in accordance with the requirements of Article 28 of the Rules of Procedure? Um, 
then mm -hmm. once once it's out of the understudy um, stage, then the petition mm -hmm. is actually processed. So it's like it it becomes officially part of the commission's system. But the commission still hasn't decided, are we actually going, you know, do you have um, a case basically to study? That's in the admissibility section. I see. So I can give an example. Um, in the admissibility phase, there was uh, an application that was presented by the Inuit Circular, I think, Council. And, and they were, oh, sorry, can you just turn off your sound? Because there's feedback. Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, there was a case where the Inuit Circumpolar Council submitted an application, and they were, I believe they were trying to make a connection between um, the American Convention and climate change, like the effects on people's rights through climate change. And in the admissibility stage, the commission looked at the argument and they said, we don't have competence to look at this issue of climate change because it's not in the American Convention. So because of that reason, it can't go forward. Okay, um, that explains the differences, thank you. Um, for the follow-up process in the step four, um, I'm wondering when the commission checks up if the settlements or recommendation is being followed, is there any repercussions if the state is not following the recommendations? Like, is so there any consequences? The recommendations are not binding, so um, no, not. It's really the the commission can only encourage states to follow through with something through these thematic hearings, through the press releases, through putting uh, drawing attention to the actions of states. Uh, but at and a further step is when the commission can then send it to the court whose decisions are binding, but at the commission, it, it can only issue recommendations. I see. So like there's no obligation for the state to follow the recommendations. No, but presumably if the state has signed on to the American, uh, to the commission, and that, that means the state has has signed on to uh, all the states agreed that they're going to try and promote and protect the human rights mentioned in the human in the instrument within their territories. So the states have made a commitment to do so. It's just how much do they want to carry it out? I see. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that not many um, petitions have been placed against Canada. And uh, you gave us an example of one that has, which is the, um, which is the like, uh, I think it was the First Nations one. Mm -hmm. Is there any other examples that you can think of for uh, Canada and the outcomes of those results? Um, yeah, there was so two two of the the cases that I mentioned um, produce admissibility reports. And the other two did produce merits reports. So they went a bit further in the process. One was a case called Suresh, um, which involved looking at the rights of um, an individual that was facing deportation in Canada and the, the, um, back to Sri Lanka. And the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court in Canada and I think the final verdict from Canada was to refer the matter back to the Minister of Immigration to decide. And ultimately, what the commission found was that um, Mr. Suresh's rights had been violated to the extent that he faced torture upon return to Sri Lanka. And uh, they recommended that Canada issue um, provide reparations to Mr. Suresh. I see. 
Um, do you have any critique of the current uh, human rights violations reporting system in Canada? And do you have any um, suggestions for how we can improve the process? Um, I don't know if it's a if it's a critique, but I'll I'll um, mention this is re referencing the keynote speech from the president of the commission when she visited Canada last year, and she said that there have been cases against Canada in the commission. There's been press releases and reports, but she said a lot of the reason that there aren't more cases. It's not necessarily because Canada has the Charter of uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, or because Canada, you know, has an untouchable human rights record or something like that. She said that it a lot of it comes down to the fact that people don't know about the inter-American system in Canada, and so they don't um, they don't know to to seek recourse from the system or how to do it, and so that's. That's something that I'm hoping that this presentation will help with is to know that we are very much part of the system and we can uh, interact with the system and contribute to a regional discourse on human rights. Can you give us some examples of positive outcomes from the commission um, in other states? In other states? Um, I, I'd have to think of the particulars, but um, I believe that uh, the, the commission carried out a site visit to the United States uh, on, on asylum matters and, and migration matters that actually resulted in a change of policy. Um, but I, but I don't have my, my notes with me to be able to give you more specifics on other countries. Okay. Um, so good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I found the presentation to be very um, educational. And I, to be honest with you, I didn't know about this pan uh, inter-American system before I came to this presentation. So, yeah. Um, I don't think our audience has any questions here for you today. So, um, yeah. Is there anything you would like to add? Um, oh, Greg has a question. Go ahead, Greg. Just waiting for him to. He says, thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering what you think might be the barriers to Canada signing the American Convention on Human Rights and by extension being under the jurisdiction of the court. How might these barriers be addressed? What are the project prospects for Canada eventually signing on to the convention? Um, so um, when the president of the commission visited in 2022, she mentioned that um, originally Canada took issue with Article 4 of the American Declaration of Human Rights because the language of that article um, mentions uh, human life beginning at conception. And Canada was worried that this article would be interpreted in a way that would limit women's sexual and reproductive rights, and especially on issues connected to abortion. And so um, that was originally what was a, a reservation that Canada had about signing. And what the president of the commission said uh, when she visited was that, look, over the past 30 years, this article has never been interpreted in a way that would curtail women's uh, sexual reproductive rights. And actually, we've seen the opposite, that the system has um, come out very strongly in favor of women's, women's rights. So what she was suggesting was, look, it's a non-issue. And also, um, it is possible for Canada to sign on to, to ratify uh, the American Convention and also submit that they have a reservation about a particular article. It's possible to do that. So you can sign on to the document, but it doesn't have to be wholesale. You can still say, but I take issue with this particular article. And so um, that's entirely possible for Canada to do. And 
I think um, in terms of barriers to signing, I think lack of uh, understanding or knowledge about the system is one of the barriers um, because the more well-versed we are in understanding the system and how it works, the more we can uh, thoughtfully contribute to a conversation about being part of it. And I think Canada would really benefit from being part of this regional system as the system would benefit from Canada's participation as well. Thank you for your answer. So I think Article 4 is what's stopping Canada from signing. It's what originally was stopping, and but it just seems like that argument doesn't really hold so much water 30 years later. Okay. Does anyone else here in the audience have any questions for uh, Andrea here? How does this court differ from the ICJ or other international courts or commissions? Well, um, the International Court of Justice is um, a, a court that looks at the actions of states. So it will always be one country versus another country. And this court is, is special in that an individual so you and I, or, or um, an organization on an individual's behalf can bring a claim through the commission and then through the court. So in that sense, it's, it's different than the ICJ. And for the International Criminal Court, it, well, it, it was created through its own, um, its own human rights instrument, and it's an international court. And so in that sense, it also differs in the types of issues that it looks at. So the International Criminal Court has um, is looking at things like crimes against humanity and genocide and other um, aspects like that. And so, again, this, this court is regional in the sense that it's interpreting and applying a regional human rights instrument, which is the... American Declaration for Human Rights. Thank you for your answer, Anne, Andrea. Um, does anyone else in the audience have any questions? Okay, I don't think that anyone else has anything to ask. Um, Andrew, Andrew, do you have any um, closing remarks? Um, I just wanted to say uh, thanks so much for coming to the presentation. I'm really, really happy to share. And if you have any questions, um, you can always follow up by email.